Thanks for waking up with us. So thank you so much, and um, I will pick up from somewhere some of my colleagues left, and Amina in particular spoke about how AI is a very powerful tool for science. But it's also a story of the shifts of power. Who holds power? Who has agency of influence in this new world? And while it's clear that AI systems offer opportunities across various domains and contexts, which we heard some about, what amounts to responsible perspective on their ethics and governance is yet to be realized, and few have accomplished any real impact in modulating its effects. And we know that AI systems and algorithmic technologies are being embedded and scaled far more quickly than the maturity of the technology supports currently, and existing governance frameworks are still evolving. But why are we not getting it right? Allow me to share a few reflections, and maybe along the way debunk a few myths, or at least leave you with some questions to ask. And I think that's very core to this whole debate about AI, is learning how to ask good questions as it permeates, AI-based systems are permeating our lives. First, too often the debate on AI is presented as a technology will evolve on its own separate trajectory. This is not the case. It is human all the way. Every novelty, every challenge, every bias, every value, every opportunity. We are at an inflection point, but it is a human, and to some degree political. Some would even say that it's a theological one, but it's certainly not a technical one. Second, many of the existing dialogues are too narrow and fail to understand the subtleties and life cycle of an AI system, and there's sometimes limited functionality and impact. We heard some of this task orientation as we discussed you know, the various applications of AI, and it's important to remember that. It is a very task-focused tool currently. Moreover, the scientific methods and complexity underpinning what the what and the how and the why of an AI system is poorly understood by decision makers. We thus need a better scientific and anthropological intelligence, both when building foundational models, but also in how we think about future applications of artificial intelligence. Third, the debate focuses on some aspects of ethics while ignoring other aspects that are more fundamental and sometimes more challenging. For example, what potential might they have to perpetuate existing inequalities and create new ones? We heard Daniel Kahneman speak about the noise in decision-making, about the human complexity in decision-making and how some decisions might perpetuate in certain biases, while a machine algorithm is no different. But in the ethics field, this is called the ethics washing, creating a superficially reassuring but illusory sense that ethical systems and issues are being adequately addressed to justify pressing forward systems that end up deepening current patterns. Fourth, I call it the overfitting over-promising, over-premising, and under-delivering trap. In a variety of sensitive systems, from healthcare to employment to justice to defense, we are rolling out AI systems that may be brilliant at identifying correlations, but do not understand causation or consequences, something that also Kurai spoke to. This carries with it significant risks, especially when deployed into politically fragile context or when deployed in the public sector. Fifth, discussions on AI and ethics are still largely confined to the ivory tower. More informed public discourse and serious investment in civic education, digital literacy, diverse participation, as we also heard in the uh, Daniel Kahneman address, transdisciplinarity around the societal impacts of the biodigital revolution is highly necessary. Sixth, too much of what the general public currently perceives about AI comes from sci-fi troops and blockbuster movies. 
we need better ways to communicate to the public that beyond the hypothetical risks of future of AI, some of which we just heard about, there are real and imminent limitations posed by why and how we embed AI systems that currently shape everyone's daily lives and who gets to decide when and how to do it. Seventh, the public discourse on AI is not sufficiently addressing downstream consequences and are too often focused on myopic tech solutionist optimization approaches rather than what problem we're trying to solve and what that problem requires. Sometimes that's not AI. I call this the AI pixie dust problem. This includes how to reduce any potential environmental impact from resource intensive computations, issues concerning data ownership, to how we cultivate talent, build digital literacy and AI influency and create shared spaces and vernacular to share insights. We spoke about science as a new language, but it's also important of making sure for, to have a transdisciplinary dialogue that we have a shared vernacular to really be able to do that meaningfully. Specific hard questions rarely enter into the public discourse, despite its importance to safely embedding AI systems into the public realm. These include concerns about interoperability of AI systems. How and, how and can we truly design and build both fail-safe, but also fail-secure mechanisms into AI systems? So they safely interrupt and protect themselves if an unexpected change in circumstances, be that weather patterns or something else, leads them to cause harm or the potential of harm. The jury seems to still be out on this one and regulations remain embryonic or opaque at best. Interoperability is another underappreciated problem. From autonomous vehicles to financial technologies and defense applications, no matter how well designed an individual system may be, there is a potential for unanticipated consequences if it is not able to operate smoothly with other systems. Additionally, the reach of AI systems into every aspect of daily life was dramatically accelerated by the pandemic lockdowns, which shifted more social and economic activities into the digital world. Leading technology companies now have effective control of many public services and digital infrastructures through procurement or outsourcing schemes. Governments and healthcare providers deployed AI systems in proximity tracking and in tracing applications and bioinformatic responses at an unprecedented scale. This has triggered a new economic sector organized around the flow of biodata, our biodata. Another consideration of concern is that the people who are most vulnerable to negative impacts from AI are also least likely to be able to join the conversation, either because they have no digital access or their lack of digital literacy makes them ripe for exploitation. Such vulnerable groups are often theoretically included in discussions, but not empowered to take a meaningful part in those same discussions. This engineered inequity alongside human biases risks amplifies otherness and worse, othering, through neglect, exclusion, mis- and disinformation, with significant consequences. And these are real issues we need to tackle. More insidious, perhaps, is the wider debate on intentionality versus unintentionality of the effects of technology, going beyond traditional discussions of dual use. Often this debate features claims of technology and AI being apolitical in nature, or that there's no way of fully predicting the impact once it is used. This is interestingly viewed that is particularly prominent among non-technical people, not comprehending that every technological creation embed values and values reflect culture and politics and historical patterns of behavior and economic realities. In my view, it is time to return to the drawing board and address how to translate principles into practice. We need to grapple with our blind spots. We need to question if we have the right platforms. Do we have the right people leading them? Do we have empowered people to engage with it sufficiently? In some ways, I've been here at CERN now for a few days, and we had this amazing interdisciplinary discussion, sharing views. And I really think we need to learn from the CERN experience that collaboration can provide a very effective checks and balances to make sure we get it right, to make sure that we have a responsible science and responsible evolution of this technology. We also need to be clear on what aspect of ethics are we considering and which are we overlooking. 
Are we looking at them with intention or unintentionally? We also need to be aware of whose rules, whose values and interests are we embedding into our technologies. I will leave it with that. Thank you so much. You have this unique background, military, humanitarian, technology. Uh, what can we learn from the experience in dealing, for instance, with nuclear weapons for the way we're going to deal with AI? After all, they're both gigantic scientific projects turned into big uh, uh, systems, massive systems, controlled by a limited number of players. So what can we learn from 50 years of experience more in nuclear weapons that we can apply to AI? I think there's so three quick answers to that. So one is what we can learn from the arms control in general. Mm -hmm. Then there's the nuclear science, and also I will relate this back to the CERN thing. Um, and let me actually let me start with the CERN thing. You know, one of the unique things I've heard of the last few days is how physicists here say that speaking about limitations actually empowers their research. It makes their science better. That's the type of discussion we need to have when we speak about algorithmic technologies. Okay. We also need to rethink the concepts we use in the world of AI and a lot of non-tangible assets, we no longer can speak about deterrence in the same way as we did in the nuclear area. What can we learn from the arms control in general? If you don't keep focus on what you're trying to verify, how you do the testing, validation, certification, reviews, transparency process, and the verification, it is very difficult to get a treaty that can you fully implement. And that's something we can learn, because once you try to apply those lessons from the arms control into essentially software architecture type of pieces where there are vendors and different processes, verification becomes top and center of making sure that that is a viable treaty process. Let's see if there is a question from social media. If there is one, the team is going to put it up here. Do you think that we have, oh, this is, yeah, do you think that we have today the right platforms and the right people? So you kind of hinted at this at the mm -hmm. end, but so the question is, do we have the right platform? Do we have the right people? What, what's your opinion there? I would change the question, are we empowering people in the right way okay. to actually engage in this discussion? What I'm seeing for where I stand is there's a general lack of what we call AI fluency or digital literacy. So the way we engage in the debate is often uh, influenced by the fact that there is a very poor understanding of each other's field. I think having scientists around the table, having the multi-domain expertise that you know, some of my colleagues were speaking about, but also having the translation capacity. And I noticed that there are quite a few people on the CERN staff here that are now has degrees in science communication. Mm -hmm but also science translation and policy translation. That's the type of people we need to have around the table. Do we have the right people currently? I think we have many of the right people, but I think we need to really, really expand uh, the diversity of those who participate and their ability to participate meaningfully. Okay.